What's up, everyone? Just want to take a moment to remind you fine folks that I'm always on the hunt for caught by happy guests. I'd love to give you a platform to describe why you are doing whatever it is you're doing, why you love what you do and what you had to go through to get where you are. Everyone's story is unique. And if you want to share your experience with the audience, I'd love to give you the platform to do so. Email caughtbyhappy at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we'll get the ball rolling. And if you're thinking, hey, I don't have a story. I just like listening. Then, okay, right now, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast and go ahead and leave me a rating or a review or maybe take a moment to share this show with someone who also might enjoy it. Help spread the news about what we're trying to do here. All right. All right. Let's get moving. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Caught by Happy podcast. I'm Matt Harrington, which you probably already knew, but for those of you that didn't, I figured I'd introduce myself. Now that we're acquainted and comfortable with one another, we can relax a little bit, have a nice little visit. Today on the show, I'm talking to Slash. No, not that Slash. I'm talking to Slash Coleman. He's an author, a painter, a storyteller, an all-around artist, and he's currently doing something a little out there, or at least most people might think it sounds a little out there. It's called laughter yoga, and we're going to dig into exactly what that means here in a little while. But you might recognize Mr. Coleman from some of his previous artistic endeavors. His memoir, The Bohemian Love Diaries, was released back in 2013, received very high praise, big time recognition. He supported it through a variety of tours and one man shows. And prior to that, he had a PBS special called The Neon Man and Me. He participated in a number of storytelling festivals. He's a musician. Look, the guy has done it all. He's lived all over, but he's a son of Richmond, Virginia. He was raised there, and after spending years away, he's once again calling it home. So we're going to talk to him about his extremely fascinating family history, a little bit about the eccentric personalities that shaped his entire life experiences. And hey, I got to tell you, I could have just talked to him for hours about his family. Such a rich history that starts with escaping Nazi concentration camps during the occupation of France in World War II to working on a pirate ship in the middle of Richmond and creating sculptures out of roadkill and bread. I know, you got to hear him tell it, and I'm sure he tells it in much more detail and much more in depth in his writings and his performances. So check out my show notes where I'll put some links to where you can really dig into Slash's backstory. I, too, will be diving deep into some of his stories. I'm telling you, it's just really fascinating stuff. And I switching gears a little bit, I want to let you all know that I'm starting and I'm a part of the Ring Media Network. That's R-R-I-N-G. You may have heard me mention this a couple of times in the previous episodes. And what the network aims to do is connect fellow digital content creators, podcasters, bloggers, vloggers, filmmakers, musicians, what have you, with other like-minded creators where we can just empower each other to make the best damn stuff we can possibly make. We can promote each other, lift each other up offer advice or services, and just further the reach of what we're all working so hard to produce. So if you're a creator, or if you're thinking of starting a creative endeavor, I encourage you to start following Ring Media on Instagram. That's R-R-I-N-G Media. We're just getting off the ground now, so there's there's not a lot of content out there yet. But this is your opportunity to be one of those core members of the network, Ring Media. And hey, one more thing. Just want to say real quick, thank you so much to those who reached out last week after my solo episode. I I did feel a little awkward putting some of that stuff out there into the universe, but I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad it resonated with some of you. Okay, back to Slash. I came across something he posted on LinkedIn, of all places, about laughter yoga. Strangers getting together and just full-on laughing with each other. And I thought to myself, self, now that's a story you need to share on the podcast. I sent him a little uh, LinkedIn note. And I said, hey, uh, why don't you come over to my house and come on the podcast? And what do you know? He accepted. And I'm so glad he did. Like I said, he has some very interesting and fascinating stories. And I'm so honored he shared a few with us. So here you go. This is my talk with Slash Coleman. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate you coming to my house. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's not often I get to do it in uh, in the dining room. So, <laughs> well, you know, I, I live in the fan of Richmond, and I don't know. I, I don't get opportunity to like go outside of Richmond very much. You just are always in the grind in the city and stuff. So, yeah, it's like oh, I'm gonna go out go out somewhere new, somewhere new. You're in the fan. Yeah. How long have you been there? Well, I was in Shaco Bottom for about three years, and I moved to the fan last year. Okay. So kind of. Kind of newbie there, but you're you're a Richmond native, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, well, not really. Grew up all over Richmond, really, but most of my um, 
childhood was in Chester or Chester as they yeah. as they say it. Um, but my family had a store um, in Richmond from the time I was probably a, in middle school called Tinkers Tinkering Company. It's r- very well known. It's um, one of the largest furniture refinishing companies in the state now. Um, and it started as a pirate ship. Um, my really? dad built a replica of a huge pirate ship at the Southside Plaza flea market. And we dressed up like pirates on the weekend and we sold nautical antiques. Um, really? Yeah. Is and, that, uh, right off 95 there? You can see as you're going down like the, the plaza, I'm trying to think of Southside Plaza. Now this one's like in the heart of like just the, the baddest, worst neighborhood. It was bad then really? and it's still bad now. Um, <laughs> but we would dress up like pirates and do all this pirate stuff and sell this stuff. Our cousins... Up in northern Connecticut, we have about, I don't know, 200 Sicilian cousins up there. They sold us the nautical antiques, and we resold them as pirates. And um, we would get requests, or my family would get requests for building replicas of the furniture, and that turned into making furniture, then refinishing furniture. And now it's turned into this big thing where, you know, my family employs, you know, like 30 or 40 people. There's a home decor shop in the front that my aunt runs, and it's kind of a family thing. And so... We had the choice to either go to college or work for the family business. And I was just like growing up dressed like a pirate. I was like, I'm getting out of here. I'm never coming really? back. You didn't want to stick around and be a pirate? No. And but it wasn't so much that. It was that um working close to family's hard. But this was to me, Richmond was the biggest redneck place growing up. And I just I wanted to get out of here. I wanted to lose my accent. I wanted to just not be associated with it. And it, you know, if Richmond had been like this when I left, I would have never left. But I'm I'm really proud to be be from Richmond now. And it's like a really cool place to be now. It really is. I mean, I've only been here 20 years. I've still a long time, 20 years, but I've seen such a change too. And just the culture around Richmond and not just the city of Richmond, but outside of the city, here we are in the suburbs in Chesterfield. So yeah, right. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's progressed quite a bit, I think in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So you want, you said you wanted to get out of Richmond. What you, so how did you get out of Richmond and, and break away from that, uh, pirate ship lifestyle? <laughs> yeah. Um, I left after high school and didn't think I'd ever come back. And so kind of lived all around the world. Um, I went to undergraduate school at Radford and from there I went to, um, Columbia college in Chicago. And yeah. then I studied, um, jazz piano over in London and then I just hopped around the country, um, with the idea that I would find a day job and just write. All right, hold um, on. So jazz piano in London, you yeah. don't just, I mean, you obviously must have known some piano before you got over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I started playing piano in fifth grade. Um, and, um, well, actually I started before that. My father brought a piano home. He had traded one. He, he sold road, roadkill sculptures growing up. That's how he supported us. And they, he didn't sell a lot of them, but, um, like taxidermy. Yeah. Uh, he eventually became a taxidermist. No, this was like <laughs> him picking up roadkill on his motorcycle coming home. Cause my parents only had motorcycles till I was about eight or nine years old, yeah. bringing home motorcycles. He kept them in a big freezer in the basement, all kinds of any kind of animal that he found. And then he would bake these, he had some big, big really large, um, bread baking ovens in mm-hmm. the basement and he would bake bread bodies for the animals. So a typical sculpture might have like the head of a lizard, a rid, really big, like pumpernickel body, the legs of like a deer and like a skunk tail. And we would, we would travel up, he would, the cool thing about my dad is, um, I guess it's, it, it's cool for me now. And it was kind of, um, uh, kind of confusing growing up cause there was a lot of drama. He, I, I'm, I was raised by eight artists in my family. And so there was like always a lot of drama, kind of like the, um, TV show shameless. There's also a lot of addiction in my family. So it was very okay. chaotic. Um, but the cool thing about having him as a dad, um, just like Frank in the show is like, he was my friend. And so like we would drive up to Chicago about once a month with these roadkill sculptures and sell them to a gallery and pick up whatever wasn't sold and bring it back. But at most of his gallery shows, he had a, um, a live rooster, um, named Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt, who would sit on the sculptures and eat the bread. And so the idea was the sculptures would disintegrate, um, wow. as the, as the show went on. So that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a very like kind of alternative um, so you said you were upbringing. raised by eight artists. Who else? Who uh, who uh, among the eight? Yeah. So probably my second biggest influence was my grandfather on my mom's side, who was a dancer at the Moulin Rouge. And my grandmother was with him there. My my mom was born in France. In France. Okay. Yeah. And so um, 
my grandmother was a, a set designer there, and also um, she uh, was a watercolorist. And she, you know, she didn't paint for the longest time, but after my grandfather died, probably the last 15 years of her life, she became like this Grandma Moses. She painted thousands of watercolors. Really? Thousands of them. They were like spilling out everywhere. Everyone in our family has one and um, has a few, actually. And um, there, were, she, it wasn't that she was even a great, that great of a painter. She painted landscapes because they were just all like, crooked and kind of weird. Mm. Um, so, um, those were probably, and on my dad's side, my, uh, grandfather, um, was an artist and also an upholsterer as well. And, and they were all pretty much in the same area when you were growing up. Yeah. And so, um, the, my mom side of the family is all, um, from Europe. My mom born in France, all Jewish, all came over right after the war. Um, my father, my, my grandparents, um, went underground after the Moulin Rouge closed and worked for the French resistance and sent my mom and my uncle to live in a Catholic mission. And they went, they went into camps and escaped from camps and they kind of lived the, the lifestyle of like the movie, the piano. Um, they went into, uh, uh, yeah. Um, concentration camps were able really? to escape and, and stuff like that. So it was interesting. And so on the, my dad's side, um, came over from Sicily and then intermarried with some West Virginians, um, and worked in the coal mines. Um, and so I have this, like in Richmond, I have, um, about a hundred family members, all Jewish, some in Virginia beach, and then 200 Sicilians like up in Connecticut. So the wow. family's kind of split apart. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a mix. When did they immigrate to America? The French side? Um, it's very interesting. So I went to visit, um, where my mom was born and raised during the war, um, about three years ago with my wife. And, um, I got to meet the neighbor who hid my family when the Gestapo agents would come through. And they actually took me up into the crawl space. We walked up these old stairs and like took me in the crawl space with a hidden wall where they would hide my family. And my, my grandfather, they set up my grand, my grandfather, um, when the Moulin Rouge shut, he had learned to become a tailor, um, in the costume shop there. Mm -hmm. When he came to America, there was a store in Richmond called Miller and Rhodes. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. So he became a tailor there, but he set up his sewing machine at the, at the house across the street. And so he could watch outside to see if anything was going on with my family that lived with my mom, my uncle and my grandmother who li lived there. Um, I don't know how I got on the tangent, but that, so I went there a few, um, three two two and a half years ago mm -hmm. to visit that and um i forgot what what question you asked me oh, i don't even that. know now so like <laughs> i want to know more about this yeah are, are your mom and dad are they still around yeah they're still around they're still together yeah um it's interesting because um when my family came my my mom was three when she came over her brother was nine um when they came over the family split in two so my uncle's side of the family became what i call super jewish um, married only Jewish people, celebrated the holidays, kept their traditions alive. My mother intermarried to like a redneck mm -hmm. um, and became closet Jewish and told me, don't tell anyone you're Jewish or you'll die. And so I kind of grew up with a very different experience. Yeah. So you weren't Jewish. raised in the, in the synagogue or in the... No. And I, I, um, it was a real fear that I, that I didn't even like begin to look at or explore until I was probably in my middle 30s. Um, and I'm 50 now, so wow. it took a while to even want to explore that. And I began to explore it in my writing as an artist on stage. Um, it kind of came out of the closet. Now, with, did your mom kind of tell you that because of, you know, the, the country or redneck lifestyle around here or because of what was ingrained in her from her past experience and her mother? Yeah, exactly. The latter. I, yeah. You know, I don't think it mattered, would have mattered where we lived, like what was ingrained in her and the fear in her. Mm -hmm. was as like a Holocaust survivor was like, don't tell anyone because it, it, it's that that's going to happen to you. If it wasn't it, my grandfather though, ha, on her, on her side from the Moulin Rouge had such a strong presence that I was required to be bar mitzvahed. And even though we kept that quiet, um, uh, kind of underground. And at the time, um, the synagogue that I went to, uh, was at Orami, which is, um, on Huguenot road. And at the time it was just a boarded up old house and the rabbi, I write, I wrote about this in my in my last memoir. The rabbi was what they call a rent a rabbi. They didn't have a formal rabbi, so you can rent these rabbis until you find a find a regular rabbi. And he lived out of his VW bus behind Orami, hmm. and um, taught me Hebrew in a in a kind of a broken down, smelly like VW bus. 
So you were like 12 years old at the time? Yeah. What year was this? In the 70s or 80s? Um, yeah, it was in the, in the 70s, yeah. Wow. Which was a wild time anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. So that was part of the wildness, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Um, did, did your mom ever go into detail about what she went through back then? So it's interesting because when I came out of the closet with being Jewish in my work as an artist, um, in my 30s, I really began to explore it on stage. And I um, performed a series of one-man one, uh, one solo shows and performed them all over the world. They ended up running off Broadway, becoming PBS specials, where I was basically telling the world I was Jewish and indirectly talking about my family's experience with the Holocaust. And I remember when... Um, I did one particular show. It was called Slash Coleman Has Big Matzo Balls. Mm -hmm. And it was really like a Mel Brooks kind of expression because no one tells you what to do when you're, you've are you grown up um, as a first-generation Holocaust survivor. Um, there's no book on how to do it. And so for me, like, I created these – I gave birth to a matzo ball on stage. Um, I uh, dressed up as Jesus and did Jesus stand up. And um, – that I began to perform that in D.C., and I remember when the reviews came out in the Washington Post, um, and I came home after that, my dad was like, you might want to go talk to your mom. I was like, where is she? She's like, upstairs. So I went upstairs, and she was just like freaked out. You know, she had spent her whole life like Protecting trying to protect us from anybody finding out, and here I was on stage. And that was just the first show. Over the next like 10 to 15 years, I would I would do it even more. And then... I eventually met up with uh, another author, a Jewish author named Eliezer Sobel, and we wrote a show together called Identity, um, about Jewish identity. And his mom is a Holocaust survivor too. He was a little bit older than me, and we talked about what those joint experiences were like in school um, and just growing up. He was he was he went to Hebrew school and was more out than me, but it, this kind of typifies the experience. He did this experiment where, where he tried to wear a yarmulke driving cross country and he, he only got to the first gas station before he freaked out and took it off. Really? It like, yeah. It's that, so that fear is very real with first generation. We're called first generation um, Holocaust survivors. And then the next generation, my sister's kids, my nephews, third generation, they've got tattoos with Hebrew letters on them. They wear a star David to like, well, they went to like Lee Davis high school. And so like, very, still very redneck, but that fear has kind of left them. Yeah, you know, for me, I can go on stage and tell people I'm Jewish, but then I, not any other time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's interesting because I, you know, I think, you know, this is America, and I, and you're a first generation American too, but I would think that some of that would be left behind in Europe. I mean, I can't imagine what that fear is like for Europeans as first generation uh, Holocaust survivors. Yeah, yeah, right, and so I mean. I'd say even now, and I don't know how, because even not telling anyone, particularly I'm Jewish, um, uh, they always say, my grandma always said, a Jew always knows a Jew. And so we get found out somehow. I don't know through, <laughs> in high school and middle school, I got beat up sometimes. Really? And I don't know how they found out. Um, and it was only probably about five years ago I was performing on the National uh, Storytelling Festival circuit. I was always kind of the token Jewish guy invited to tell about the younger experience on this kind of invisible, in, invisible circuit where maybe like 60 storytellers perform and make their living. Um, but it was in Delaware. And after I came off stage, um, my, all my content isn't Jewish. I mean, there it's, it's some of it's there, but it, it's not like I'm talking about, you know, reading right, the Torah and right. stuff like that. It's just, I happen to be from a Jewish background. Um, a kid about, 10 years old, and this was a, a festival that took place at a church, probably about 500 people there um, over the course of the weekend listening to diff different tellers tell their stories. Um, a kid came up to me and goes, you're that Jewish teller, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And he like made his hand like a gun and he went, Pew! and he like shot me. And, I, and so the thing was, is that um, uh, I was like, all right. And I just walked away. But then that night when I went back to my hotel, I was like, Oh, I, I got to find that kid. And, and I just don't know what he means. Um, and like, and I wasn't scared so much as him, but I was like, who are his parents, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, are, are, you know, are they going to come after me or something? So I found the kid finally. I said, Hey kid, why'd you say that? And he goes, um, he goes, you're Jewish. The Germans killed the Jews. And he did that again. And he did it again. He did it again. Held out his finger like a, like a gun and did it again. So the thing was, is that there's not like a, um, anti-Semitism phone 
fine. You can call like that, 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 and that happened, like, believe it or not, that happens probably to me, like maybe three or four times a year. It's not like I call my mom, but it happened again, mom, I can't believe it. It just, you just kind of shake it and you, you just kind of go on. But on the last night of the festival, I was talking with some tellers. They were like, how was your experience? I was like, it was all right, but let me tell you this, what happened with this kid. And I told them about the kid and then I went home. That was it. Um, it wasn't even worth talking about really. Um, just cause you let let it just roll off your shoulders. And um, the festival director called me a week later. He was, he, some, they, it had gotten back to him and he was really upset. He said, we're, we're kicking these people out of our congregation. The boy and his parents was like, actually, you should do the opposite. You need, you need to educate them, sure. like leave them in. You need right. to bring them closer. So it was about two months later, um, a letter in the, in the, arrived to me in the mail. It was in cursive by the boy. I, he, like I said, he was probably in middle school. And um, it was an apology, and he had since watched all these movies about the Holocaust and all this. And and I would have felt that it was a genuine apology, except for the fact that I found that all the tellers there, there was like 11 performance storytellers, got the same letter as well. So it was interesting. So a month later, I performed at Brigham Young University for um, for an entire month I was there performing my stories. And they brought me in specifically for the the Jewish content. And so... After one of my stories, I had that letter. I brought it with me because um, I think it had just been mailed to me. And I stood up on stage and I read the letter to the to the um, to the folks there. And do you know, like after this was the only time this has hap- this had happened. Um, everyone in the audience got in a line to meet me afterwards, and um, it was my it, that had been my first experience, kind of in Mormon country. And mm-hmm. um, they were and they were all Mormons, and they they could so identify with what had transpired with getting that letter and the feelings towards me being Jewish. And they just, they, they feel like they live that every day. Um, right. And so it was a very surprising experience to, to come off the stage and, and just share that with them, but the, the, to get that feedback from them too. Wow. So, All right. Let's jump back a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Cause this was a, an interesting <laughs> We were a long tangent. Uh, yeah, really long tangent, yeah. but a very like good backstory for uh, set up this next question, which was really yeah. go back to when you were in London at uh, studying piano. I want to know what, tra- how did you get back here, and then how did you start writing? What inspired you to start writing in the first place? Yeah, so and I think that tangent started because I said I started playing music in around the fifth grade. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have what's called synesthesia, and so like I oh, really? hear shapes and can feel sounds and stuff like that. Wow! So I learned to play the piano with synesthesia. I taught myself, and so what would happen when I would, and I detail this in my memoir, but I would sit down at the piano and um, I documented kind of um, thousands of feelings. So each chord, I could see a feeling that appear on my my hand. So I would push like a couple of different notes, and then a, the word or emotion would appear above it. And I would say, okay, if I push these three keys, it sounds like anger. If I push these three keys, it sounds like confusion. Can, um, I, can I ask what that looked like? Just like it looked like the word or? Yeah, the, the word would appear over my hand. Wow. Um, when I Before I would press the chord. It was almost like intuitively I knew what it would sound like before then. Um, and so I wanted, at, back then, my, I think I went through about 10 different piano teachers um, because I wanted them all to teach me about these, what I called emotion note combinations. I would bring my book and be like, look, look at all this. These are all the notes. And if you push them like this, is, and they wanted me to, they wanted to teach me like, you know, TV show tunes like sure. Laverne and Shirley and Nadia's theme and stuff like that. And so it wasn't till I kind of exhausted. My dad was finally taking me out to Petersburg from Chester um, to see a teacher. And that was the last one. And she wouldn't see, they would eventually, none of them would see me because I wouldn't practice any of the stuff they gave me. I would just mm-hmm. do more emotion note combinations. So anyway, um, I ended up uh, answering an ad in what was called, um, it was like a green little newspaper and it was a classified ad section. But I joined this band that my dad would take me to every Thursday night. And I was the, everyone was all these like old guys and they're like 40s like senior citizens in their 40s right mm-hmm. and because i was like right, i was like a, like really young sure. it's fifth grade but anyway we i started playing in a band and, and um with these old guys and uh we won the battle of the bands and i was hooked on music at that point i think even early on because like it the band these old guys like attracted all these women around them and i was like 
wow, this is really <laughs> cool. Cause I didn't, I felt like so out of place and like so introverted and shy at the time. Yeah. I was like, if I play these songs and they were the first ones that taught me about the chords. And so I maintained like a study, self study of piano and was in various bands up through college and then went to grad school to specifically study uh, jazz piano. And that's what brought me to London. And Believe it or not, I didn't come home until four years ago, which kind of brought me to LinkedIn and meeting you. Um, and so I stayed away. I wasn't ever going to come back to Richmond, really. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, you wow. know, I was happy being away. I lived in Portland, Oregon for six years, a very like, just like in terms of um, the art world, just very liberal, free place mm -hmm. to just like explore my, my, my art. Um, I stayed in Chicago for a while after grad school. Um, I lived off the grid in Maine where, um, I did, did a couple things to make a living, but one was selling my paintings there. And um, so when you say off the grid. What do you What do you mean? Um, off the grid, no electricity, running water. You're kind of living off off the land. I'd read a book in grad school called um, The Good Life, and it was about these two kind of intellectual professors from Vermont who decided to live off the grid themselves. And I was really inspired by that book. Wow, you can mm -hmm. grow your own food, and you don't need to have electricity, and like you can just make it and how, so long, I did. how long did you do that for? Um, I probably would have done it forever. I felt such a freedom there. But th there's a small piece in there, too, is that I'm a big surfer, and I've been surfing since I was 11. And, and I actually went there because like, I fell in, I'd i surfed there before and fell in love with uh, the surfing there in Maine. I just love cold water. I love mm -hmm. It's like when it snows, it's even better. But um, I met a woman who I got engaged to. And so that was an important part of the equation, living off the grid. I don't think I could have done it by myself. And so I would live there forever, but we broke up and, like, I lost my my stuff, man. Like I couldn't stay there by myself. It was too isolated. Yeah, yeah. How was how was it living off the grid in the those cold Maine winters? Oh, I loved it, man. Yeah, I had a Subaru Brat. It went everywhere. Um, <laughs> and wood stove and yeah, I I, I loved it. Oh, cool. Baking man. my own bread and like everything. And you were selling. And you were selling paintings. Yeah, and at that time, so I went to grad school. Not only to study, um, I studied um, the jazz piano off on the side with. I, when I looked for a grad school, I was looking for a teacher I could study with on the side. And I, uh, the first place I ended up was um, for grad school was University of New Orleans because um, Elias Marsalis, Went Marsalis' dad was there, and I wanted to study with him. So I found another jazz guy up in Chicago. Um, and I studied with him on the side and went to school for writing. Um, but when I got I got kicked out of the writing program for publishing stuff about the program, which is <laughs> ironic. And, um, and I was still studying piano on the side. And when... Uh, I said to the, the, I remember talking to the dean, I said, I'm going to lose all my student loans and we have to leave Chicago. And he goes, why don't you take some classes in education? Because I had applied to the Peace Corps at the time. And um, I stayed, I took some classes in education and decided it was more important to kind of finish something in my life. It, if I had taken some classes in math, I would have probably gotten a master's in math. But I took, I became a, I took, I finished up with a master's in education there. Are you naturally good at math? No, that's why I said that. I'm really bad at math. Oh. <laughs> but but if he, if they would have said, why don't you take some classes, in, I don't know, in um, in physics or in accounting, yeah. I probably would have just gotten a master's in any of that. It was just really important for me to not leave and go in the Peace Corps and stay and finish something and, and have that kind of thing that I needed to finish for my life. Do you remember back then what you, like what in the back of your head, what were you wanting to do like what was your ultimate goal back then because you said you were painting you were writing you were doing music did you want to do all of those things was there one thing that you really wanted to focus on and go all in on it's interesting well, to answer that question i think of my dad who's um a really brilliant sculptor and i feel if he would have continued with his sculpture work he would have been in museums like it but the thing was is it came so easy to him there was no challenge it was like he would just wake up and make this brilliant piece of sculpture. Mm. So he decided to paint his whole life. And to be honest, like he's not a very good painter. The hands don't match the arms and the perspective's wrong. And this is really challenging for him. But like, I think he really, really likes it um, because of that challenge. Yeah. And so for me, um, performing and being on stage, I think it comes naturally because it maybe came from my grandfather being a dancer at the Moulin Rouge. Um, it, that was just really easy. I would never, I never studied theater and you know, I, I was never in a, um, a, uh, an acting class, but it was always very easy to get up there. 
writing was more of a challenge to me. And I, I went to grad school because I wanted to like write books mm-hmm. and be like the next Hemingway. And so that's why I went there. When I got kicked out, um, I was like, oh, I'll, I think I'll do the next best thing, which is get this degree in education, and now I'll, I'll be able to support myself until I sell my books. And so I told everyone in the education program, they're like, where are you going to teach when you get on? I was like, I'm going to Maine, and I'm going to fix fish, uh, fishing nets on the side and work at 7-Eleven and, and write my books. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I didn't. I ended up, so I ended up getting a Montessori certificate and ended up being a developmental therapist in kind of my own Montessori school that I set up there um, while I sold my paintings. That was right when I started to sell paintings on the side. I wasn't mm-hmm. selling a lot of them, but eventually when I left Maine and moved to Portland, I would make my living exclusively by selling my artwork and my paintings at the Portland Saturday Market. So it was like a big shift. And What about these um, books that you were writing? Yeah, you know, I think um, what I wasn't prepared for um, the amount of rejection, and it was very um, traditional, old school way of getting published back then, where you would just get addresses and send your. And I don't think that's that way anymore. Email has made it much easier mm-hmm. and different. But you just, you I would a big, s- like manuscript in an envelope that you send out. Yeah, it was, and you made you you spent like half your months. Um, pay on like making these like copies just to send out and then you would wait like a year and a half to get this like you know 200 page manuscript back with like nothing or rejecting wow. rejected so um so i continued to write and um you know i remember one of my writing professors said well you you don't really have a lot to write about until you're 40 anyway and i was in my 20s and i was like what do you know but then i was like <laughs> wow he was right you yeah, really right. don't have much to write about right so yeah, who wants to read about a twenty-year-old struggle? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and right? they haven't been through it yet. Yeah. So, what were you shopping around at that point? Did you have one thing that you were shopping around, or did you have a couple of different books or ideas for books? Yeah, I had. Um, so, this is interesting. When I went to grad grad school, um, I only applied to three grad schools. I applied to Yale, Harvard, and Brown. I had like a two point undergraduate GPA. I felt in some I, and maybe this was the twisted way I was, um, this kind of like magical realism that is in all my writing where I just wasn't rooted in reality. I thought, man, I was one of those writers kind of like, I'm this homeschool guy that grew up on a sheep farm, never been to school. And like, whatever I write is just brilliant. They're going to see that in my essay. Right. I didn't get into any of those schools. And mm. I was like, what am I going to do now? And so I remember I went back to the, um, tinkers and worked on the ship for the summer. And I was like, I got to get out of here. Got to get to grad school. And so that year I took all the money I earned and I applied to 22 grad schools that next year. There was in the writer's market magazine, it listed just all the addresses. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the next year was worse because I, of the 22, I got into 17 that year. Mm. Um, so I, then I didn't know where to go. Right. And that's why I said I first went to New Orleans and I, when I was driving down there in my car, I was like, man, I can't live in a big city. I've never lived in a city. I, I don't think I want to deal with the pollution and all that and the chaos. So then I went there for a week and dropped out. And then I went to um, wow. University of North Carolina at Greenville, which is really small, but it would allow me to surf. It was really close to the, the coast. And I was there for a week and it felt like just a little high school there. I, was, I talked to the, the dean and he was like, yeah, you shouldn't be here. I was like, well, I kind of blew my chances at all the other schools except Chicago. They don't start till in September. He goes, go there, man. That's where you should go. And so I, that, you know, I ended up there. Yeah, you didn't want to go to the big city. You went to a small town and then they said, get to the big city. Yeah, and right. Went. So I ended up, ended up there. And so, um, you know, so to go back to your, your question is like, what was I shopping around then? Um, I, I had written like a, I had written at three novels by the time I got to grad school. They oh, were shit. awful. They were yeah. really bad. You know, I just finished what I call my first novel now and sent it to the editor and, and she sent it back to me. Um, early last year and she goes i've got great news for you this is going to be your retirement it's like brilliant but you have to rewrite the whole thing oh geez and i realized like in that moment i became a novelist because i i was i my books in the past have reviewed really well and they've they've sold really well um but they weren't novels and that's a whole different genre and it requires a whole different way of storytelling um that isn't really kind of weaving a tale on stage or or writing a memoir and so you know it's been a it I feel like finally, after a year of re-editing the book I had already been working three years on this novel, I, I finally became a novelist. But you know, the, all that, all the books, the three books that I had written in my twenties and thirties, um, none of it was sal- salvageable. It was just like 
looking back on it, it because was they like, were memoirs of or um, just because it wasn't really good writing. There wasn't mm. like a lot. I think I was just kind of it was kind of I, I feel like it's about get to become a successful writer. It's like this is my theory. Like you have to get your word count up. You have to get. And once you hit like 2 million words, it doesn't matter how you get there, whether you get there writing 2 million words in school or like signing your name on checks or what kind of those words are. I think at that point, it's kind of like what Malcolm Gladwell says, that 10,000 hours. If suddenly there's that flip happens and you're suddenly like, well, I've got content and I've like got a craft that I've polished and now I can like create it. And you can look back on it and be okay with it not being that good of writing because it was leading you up to where you are now type of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So can you t- can you talk a little bit about the difference in your process from writing a memoir to writing a novel? How has that changed uh, yeah. in the process of writing? Well, before my last memoir was published, I remember um, getting into a writing group and they were helping me. I was workshopping it through them. And I'd always been like a, a real big proponent of... Um, of writing groups ever since I learned one of my favorite authors, Chuck um, Palahniuk, um, was in a writing group, and he really he was with a lot of other famous people That's in that the, writing uh, group. Fight Club guy, yeah, Fight Club know, guy, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, you know, all the it was like everyone in his group ended up publishing a lot of stuff. But he ended up really, you know, I think at the time he was like a diesel mechanic working on trucks, and suddenly like went to writing novels. And so I was like, wow, you know, I really kind of admired what he did. And so I remember being in that group, and we were editing what would be the really early version of what would become my memoir, The Bohemian Love Diaries, which was the book that came out in, in 2015. And um, it was in novel form. And eventually everyone in the group agreed. They were like, why are you kind of masking your life in a novel? We can see like you're just like giving different names to people and like trying to fictionalize it. You should just be a memoirist and like be writing the truth. Mm-hmm. And when I did that, it, it, it total sense of freedom hit me. I mean, it took another kind of six years to to rewrite that book as a memoir and find an agent and get it published and all that kind of stuff. But it, but it was true. And then since then, it's all been memoir. My life, my shows on PBS, the, the stuff I perform on stage. But the interesting thing is, is that I remember when I was first sending that novel out to get published before it became a memoir. And... um in the last paragraph of a query letter, it's usually when you talk about your platform, why should we publish you? And back then there was no social media, but like now Mm -hmm. it'd be like how many followers you have. And we want to know that you can sell the book and I, without our our help. And I didn't have a platform. And so I remember beginning to actively perform on stage to get that platform. And eventually the performance took over and I had no time to write. I was like touring like 200 days out of the year. You started performing as a platform to sell your yeah, and that platform took over, and um, yeah, I kind of got lost in it. If if, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But if what happened four years ago didn't happen, I'd still be performing two hundred days out of the year, going like, by, I really expect to have twelve books out by now, and like a lot of them be bestsellers. But I spent twelve years of my life touring around the country on stage, very wow. successfully. Um, but that was never the point. The point was to pull off stage at some point and say. Now I've got all these reviews. I've got this platform. I can sell the books. Mm-hmm. So, but I never, I was never able to do that. Um, and I think some of it is like being, in, and I think this is, um, uh, I think so much for me, it was pre social media, but I think what happened was our culture caught up to it was like, it's very addicting to be on stage. And like, it's kind of like people saying, I like you, I like you, I like you. Yeah. And like clapping and, I've heard and that, that external <laughs> validation. Who, yeah. It's what people get from social media. And so sure. it was hard to pull away from that and be like, no, nah, I just want to like right now and like push that away. Yeah. So how did you? So four years ago on my book tour, my right lung collapsed. Um, mm-hmm. And I went into St. Mary's Hospital for a month. I was living up in New York City at the time. And I came, so I, I came back uh, to Richmond for Thanksgiving and I picked up a, I was getting ready to leave the family dinner and someone was going to take me to the, back to the train station to go to, to New York. And um, I picked up my book bag and I felt like I pulled every muscle in my body. My lung had actually collapsed, but I didn't know it. And so like, I just man- by picking up your book bag. Yeah. And so wow. I, ma- I manned up and I pretend like nothing happened because there's a lot of guy guys in my family and they would have called me a wimp and like made fun of me. So I went to the, I went to the, um, the st- uh, train st- train station and someone took my bag and then I had to get someone the taxi driver to get my bag when I got off it hurt so bad and so I continued on my tour for the next um couple months until Christmas I was in Houston and 
um, San Diego and West Virginia. And my th- the way I performed changed at that point. I was performing stories from the book, but usually I'd perform for an hour and then play some music in there as well. Um, that was kind of like the way I'd been doing it. And um, uh, I could only perform for about 10 minutes at a time. And then I had to like sit, I had to have a stool on stage and I had to get people to carry my stuff back and forth, my guitar and stuff like that. So at Christmas when I came home, oh, and at night this weird sound started kind of being emitted from my body, which when I would sleep, it would go. And so I thought I had a bad cold, and plus I had pulled this muscle on my back. Well, yeah, That's what I, was I thought. Say, was that what she thought. Is that what she thought? You yeah. just pulled a muscle and you had a cold? Yeah, and I couldn't sleep on one side because that back hurt on one side. So when I came up for Christmas, my mom, because I didn't have insurance at the time, my mom was like, you should go to the doctor. I was like, well, he's going to give me medicine. You know, I hate medicine. And like then he's medicine for my cold and then pain relievers for my back. And so she said, go. And so I went. And I'm glad I, I did it because I wouldn't be here if I didn't. So they took an x-ray at the doctor and they said, um, within the hour they were doing the first surgery, they said your lung collapsed. And it, it had been collapsed for two months. They said if I'd gone another month, that lung would have fully collapsed, the heart would have fallen over, and then the other lung would have fallen over. Um, they said in some cases it healed themselves, but mine was so bad it wasn't going to heal itself. Wow. So That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. so did you have to have surgery? Yeah, so I actually... I, I had like an exp- so I spent almost a month in the hospital. I spent um, Christmas and New Year's of, of 2014 leaving into 15. It was months, a couple months after my book, my book tour started. I was supposed yeah. to go on a 23 city book tour. Um, but did it kind of did uh, that, you know, deter the sales of your book? Did you not go on the I'm tour? Not, well, I, I was, you know, I was four, three or four cities in. So yeah, I canceled the rest of my tour. I can't I actually canceled. The rest of my year, um, mm. there was only, yeah, I just can't, I had, I probably had another 170 um, gig set up and I just was like, sorry, I, I can't do this. And so I could move my arm for a while. I moved back into my parents' house and um, I eventually went from walking around, you know, from one, from the living room to like the bathroom and then eventually to the mailbox and back to eventually like kind of like, you know, it, it was pretty hard on me. But when I left, the doctor said that laughing, sneezing, and coughing would help my lung heal. And mm-hmm. so um, for a long time, I hated to do any of those things. I wouldn't watch comedies on TV because it would shake my lung where they had done the surgery. And um, and so, and I didn't like the cough and sneeze, even though the doctor encouraged it, it was helping the lung heal. But for the next year of probably around 2015, um, I watched TV, ate a lot. My self-confidence went down. My self-esteem went down. And I felt like I had the flu, like for a year. I didn't want to be around people. But finally, when I kind of emerged out of that kind of funk, um, I googled laughter in Richmond, and because the doctor said this is going to really help you, and I ended up in a kind of expensive improv comedy class at a theater down mm-hmm. in Richmond. And I thought that's what the doctor meant by you know laughing, and I hated it. It felt like a comedy competition. Um, you know, whose line is it anyway makes it seem really easy to like make people laugh. Yeah. Um, but it, it wasn't for me. I can like create funny stuff on paper and like rehearse it and make it sound really great. But in the moment, I, I'm not that great at it. And so I dropped out after two classes. And what I realized was that that wasn't the kind of laughter the doctor was talking about or, or anyway, that it was going to make others laugh, but it wasn't going to help me laugh. Yeah. Um, so I Googled laughter again after about another month. And, um, ended up in a laughter yoga session. Never heard of it. It was being taught around VCU um, at a church there. And it was being taught by a counselor. I went to, she only taught six sessions, then went back to counseling full time. So I kind of went in into an interesting window where I found it. And I was blown away. Um, it was the weirdest. I do, I've done a lot of weird things at the time. That was probably one of the weirdest things I'd done, really? laughing with strangers yeah. for a full hour. But the doctor was right for a couple of reasons. One, I felt oxygen being pushed into my body in ways it never had before. And I'd been on an oxygen mask for a long time and done tons of breathing exercises that they had recommended. And um, I felt a really profound connection with everyone in the room. Um, and did I couldn't it, explain it. I'd did it eventually, physically hurt at first to laugh like that? Um, n- no, no. I, I, you know... I, well, I would say yes and no. Mm. So during that year I was healing, like I couldn't, I couldn't laugh without pain at all. Um, during probably that, some of those first six sessions of laughter yoga, um, 
I'm not going to say like some of it didn't hurt, but most of it didn't. Mm. So some of it hurt and some of it didn't, but I could feel it healing in a way. It wasn't, it was different than I was watching a show on TV and laughing like, Oh, that hurts. I don't want to laugh. Yeah. Was it um, just a different type of laughter? Like, well, I think because it was, um, the exercises in laughter yoga were opening up, um, the, the body to all the, to kind of like maximum oxygen intake. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that was very different than to just sit on a couch after six hours and you're like, ha, ha, ha. but then like you're doing these exercises that open the body up to allow more oxygen in. Um, but the profound connection I felt with everyone in the room was really interesting because after being isolated for so long, it was immediate connection. And I had done yoga many times before, never talked to anyone doing regular yoga. I'd gone to the gym and maybe yeah. said hi to one person. I felt like I left with 12 best friends and that kind of changed my life from that point on. I mean, I haven't been on, I, I that's been like almost f three, four years and um, I'm not back on tour. I'm not back on stage that I, I left that life um, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And you said you've formed a profound connection with the people in the room. Like, do you, are you friends with them? Do you talk to them? Are they, you know, are, are these, would you, we consider them friends or people that you just have like connections with now? Yeah. Well, I think more importantly is the trajectory of like what happened. So now I yeah. not only have like those 12 friends, I have almost 20,000 friends I've done laughter yoga with since then. And so that when the teacher went back to um, counseling full time, she said, if you want more of this, you have to get trained yourself. And I was like, all right, I'm selfishly want to do more of this. And so I got trained to do it. And this was in um, 2017. And so I set up an experiment the next year from 2018 to 2019, where I said I would find, I'd rent a space. Um, and I became a certified laughter yoga leader. Um, I would, I found a space to rent and, um, for a full year, I would do laughter yoga with strangers. Um, and there would be three parameters, um, that my experiment would be built around one. Um, I wouldn't let people know it was me. Cause if I, if I do a reading, if I do a reading in town or entertain people, like I get five, four or 500 people to show up. Mm -hmm. I did want to entertain. I just want to be present with people. I want people to find laughter yoga. Like I did, if they need it, they're finding it. And I did, I didn't want to entertain anymore. And two, um, I would provide it for free as service work to my community. Cause I'm really believe that when we do service work or volunteer work, it kind of goes out into the world as like a blessing and, yeah. and, and, and helps other people. And the third thing was I would say yes to anybody that asked for it. And so during that year long experiment, um, and I feel it was really kind of based around a marketing technique around promotion rather than, uh, or I'm sorry, attraction rather than promotion. I didn't promote it all. Mm -hmm. I just I let people hear about it and they would come. But I ended up during that first year working with almost um, 9,000 people came to those free sessions. I set up uh, sessions at the Veterans Hospital, the Childhood Cancer Foundation, probably 50 nonprofits in town. Just people would find me and want me to bring it to wherever they were. And you, I set up a website eventually, probably after the sixth or seventh month, month mark, and you had to really... There was no way on the website you could hire me for anything. Mm -hmm. It was all free, and it didn't say click here to like call my number and bring me in. You really had to like be dedicated to like track me down to bring a laughter yoga session there. Um, what do you, what are the motivations for some of the people that seek you out? Are they c looking because they have an injury that they need to heal, or is it what? What are the other reasons? I'm sure there are more. Yeah, than just physical pain. Yeah. Um. I so after that year. I, We've I've backed down now this year where I just do two free sessions a month, mm -hmm. and um, now it's probably like fifty to one hundred people come to each session. We have to turn people away. I feel like maybe um, forty to fifty percent of the people come because maybe they've heard something about this weird laughter thing and they want to try it out. Mm -hmm. um, maybe ten percent come because they're they're yogis and they're like, oh, this sounds fun. I'm gonna like do yoga while I laugh. And it's, there's no mat, there's no poses. There's you don't no. have to be flexible. So, <laughs> right. um, so there's that percentage. And then the other percentage of people that come, I'd say, so during that year long experiment, I, I think about 10% of the people who came were s suffering severe loss. This might be, and it's very, um, grief. like first responder grief where it's like, wow, I lost my husband last week and I don't know why I'm here, but like I'm here oh cause I want to try this. And, or, um, I'm in a lot of pain. When I began to connect with places like the Chronic Pain and Fibromyalgia Association in Richmond, they began to send people, and they found that 
an hour of laughter, they would get probably seven hours of pain-free um, living after that. So there's there's such a release of what I call a um, cocktail of chemicals in the body, dopamine meaning one of them, sure. um, that they would live pain-free and sleep very well those nights. And so it began to attract a lot of people like that, including sufferers of asthma too. Um, they would cough a lot, but it would open up the lungs in a way that had never been opened up before. Um, and so the whole interesting thing about that experiment was that so a doctor created this in 1995, Dr. Madan in India, and um, he found he was getting better results with um, laughter with his patients than he was with medicine. Mm. So he decided, he told his wife he was going to start this laughter club based on jokes. And so they went to a park in 1995 and told jokes, and no one really laughed at their jokes <laughs> right. out loud. There was only four, four of them, and they didn't know of enough jokes. So yeah. the next day they brought 10 people, and like a lot of people were offended by the jokes, and like they were kind of dirty, and they were like... No, we don't want to do this. And so the doctor said, give me 24 hours and I'll come up with this revolutionary idea where we'll laugh without using jokes, comedy, or humor. And when he did that, by the end of kind of um, that first week of creating exercises around without using jokes, comedy, or humor, about 50 people had joined. At the end of five years, 50,000 people joined him in the park. And at that point, he put his uh, medical practice in the back seat and opened up Laughter Yoga University to train people what he did. Um, and so, so a- anyway, so the, the main benefits of it, when we laugh for over 10 minutes, it's like a booster shot to the immune system. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting ready to publish a piece in psychology today about, you know, with the, the um, coronavirus going on and how that may or may not affect like our need to connect and trumping the need to like boost our immune system. Um, but the doctor hasn't had a cold in the 26 years since he started it. And I haven't gotten sick in, in the last four years since wow. I started it. And I've almost used it as kind of like a backup plan for my health insurance. Like I, I have to keep doing it because I'm afraid something will happen to my lung if I don't, yeah. um, cause it feels still a little vulnerable. Um, but it's also an aerobic activity after 10 minutes. So when we're laughing for an hour, um, participants can expect to, to burn like four or 500 calories and take about 1200 steps. Um, so we, during that year, I would have even people come in wheelchairs and lose weight. We had regulars come and lose, um, significant amount of weight just by laughing wow. and, and being involved in the activity. But the cool thing about it is like some people will sit the whole time. You're not going to burn calories and take steps there, but some people would get really get involved the whole time. So it's set up for all ages, all abilities, bad backs, back knees, you know, kind of any type of kind of person kind of benefits from that way. Um, but the need, the big thing for me was that connection I felt during that first session, the, yeah. ki- the chemicals release, especially serotonin, which is like what's released in the body when like a, your like fourth grade teacher said, wow, this is really great job. I really like what you're doing. That sure. kind of feeling that like, I feel really good. We, we get that feeling when we laugh with strangers. Yeah. And that's why I asked is because, you know, they say that you form a bond with somebody when you go through a traumatic experience, but also, when you can make somebody laugh, they feel very close to you. Yeah. So yeah. it's, you know, kind of like the opposite of the traumatic thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for me, like, if you come and laugh during a session for an hour and it's your thing, um, which means, like, you enjoyed it, mm-hmm. it's kind of like meeting with all those strangers for a week and having coffee for an hour a day yeah. for a week and, and talking stories with them. There's a vulnerability that, like, happens. I also think that, you know, we're as a society, we're kind of missing that connect, that personal connection because we're getting that dopamine response by seeing that somebody yeah. liked our Facebook post, yeah. you know? So getting that in person has got to, you know, help us as humans. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree for sure. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you just a few questions. Uh, all right. First question. What was your first grade teacher's name? And tell me something that you remember about him or her. Um, her name was Mrs. Albright, and I had this huge crush on her and she had frosted hair. Um, I don't know if they even frost hair anymore. Um, (laughs) and and I don't even know what a crush entailed at that age, but, um, I remember just getting butterflies whenever she was around. Really? I don't know what happened to her or where she went. Was she a a younger woman? She must, she must have been. And this was in the seventies where she was probably wearing polyester and, um, I remember in her class, I had a pet snake named Jack, and I brought him to school in a hamster cage without telling my parents, and he escaped. And it was the big thing in school, like the snake escaped, and everyone was scared. So. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of things without my parents' permission. Uh-huh. like that. So. Cool. I love that story. Um, all right. Now tell me something that 
you don't like or that you're frustrated with with your current situation, whether it's the laughter yoga or not performing or not uh, or you're uh, getting your book rewritten? Um, so I grew up in a really kind of blue collar family where we, we work with our hands, you know, especially with the furniture business and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I started, um, when I came back to Richmond and decided not to put that I didn't want to perform anymore. Um, I started my own business doing upholstery in gyms. And so I had learned to upholster, um, through my family. And um, the problem is it was only ever meant to be a day job still to support the writing. Because when I came, after my surgery, like in living in New York, I came I with no money in any bank accounts. I came back with zero, you know, and like, I was like, I need to, my books aren't going to sell immediately. What am I going to do? I don't, I've kind of cut off myself from performing. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, even though it was very lucrative and would pay me, I just didn't want to, I was done telling my stories on stage. Mm -hmm. It just seemed a little narcissistic. Um, but that's really taken off. And I have this bond with having a, a um, you know, doing um, manual labor. Um, I've had to hire someone to help me now with the, it's, I have a sewing machine. I, I have all the contracts for like 22 of the YMCA's in town, the Planet Fitnesses. I go there during the week and do their gym upholstery, the pads and mm -hmm. vinyl, and then I leave. Um, but it's taken off and it takes up a lot of my time that yeah. I want to spend kind of with my writing. But, um, now that I have a family and, you know, I'm in this kind of interesting place because a lot of people would like to have the problem of having a successful business, sure. but it's not necessarily the business that, that that's my calling. Yeah. So how you are know? you, how are you planning on balancing that? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, you know, I wake up really early and work on my writing here and there and I come home and work on my writing. Um, and so I, I'm not really sure that's, that's, um, especially, um, I have a little baby girl due in a couple of weeks. I, I, my life's about to change in, yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. First. Yeah. First. Oh man. Yeah. My first yeah. was a girl as well. Okay. It, I mean, it totally <laughs> changes your world. Yeah. 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 Okay. Tell me something that you love about your current situation. Um, well, my la my last memoir was most it was about my family. It was about all my failed love relationships too. I just couldn't get it together in terms of um, finding a romantic relationship that would with the right person. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted kids since I was, but I couldn't get the first part to work, which was the relationship. Yeah. I'm in a really good relationship, and I just love this person. And it's like really, it's really easy and effortless. And um, I, I don't know. I I finally found like I felt my found my person. Yeah. Yeah. So. How does that help your uh the your creative process? Does it help you write better? Does it kind of, you know, you're now pulling from pain because everything is so happy and good. Yeah, well, it's interesting because um she's a children's librarian, which uh -huh. um I really love the fact that like our house is just always full of books and she's always bringing books home. Um but the last the piece that's with an editor now is a, a children's book. Um Oh, but, is it? Yeah. The novel? No, no, that's that the well the novel, the novel is kind of the novel. Um, I don't know which novel, but <laughs> okay. There's, you said <laughs> yeah. there was a novel that uh, your uh, publisher, somebody came back to you and said, "It's great. You're, it's going to." Oh yeah, you're right. Retirement. Yeah, so I'm working on that on the side, but I've, I've always got a lot of okay. projects going on. But the the children's book is finished; it's going through its lats edit. So oh, okay. per perhaps like later this year, we'll make a sale on that. It's about a. Um, and this is your first children's book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then the other book, which is a kind of a bad news bears baseball book, a young adult book. Okay. Um, that's just kind of, I've got, I'm still in the midst of the rewrites on that. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Tell me about the children's book. What that, what's that about? Um, it's kind of a, a, a series of books with this, um, the son of a famous um, uh, sumo wrestler, He's a really big guy. And everyone thinks he's, um, uh, I guess, you know, big and tough, but he doesn't want to be a sumo wrestler and he's a real wimp, but he, he decides to confront his fears and get his first tattoo. And so he goes in this tattoo parlor and he's afraid of pain and he doesn't want to do it. And he meets this little girl and, um, she sings to him and, um, she kind of holds his hand through the process and it's like, find that courage in your heart to, to, oh man, find, I love that to do what you want to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And the last question is, um, you know, it's, it's the cliche, 
Where do you see yourself in five, ten years? What are the what are the ultimate goals for, with with laughter yoga, with the book, with the family, and everything? Yeah. So um, I just sent out a newsletter to um, the fan base around Laughter Yoga Richmond, and I said, just so you know, like um, there's going to be a new addition to the family, and you know, I see myself sitting across from her in a couple of weeks. When she's due on March 26th, and really having a talk with her and saying, you know what? you ready to come to laughter yoga with me? And I, she's going to look at me and say, only if I can teach. And I'm like, you got it, babe. <laughs> so like, I really wanted to grow up and I, like, as soon as I can, I'm going to put her in my hippie pouch and like, take her there, you know, yeah. and like, you know, just take her to laughter yoga. Maybe she's going to, then I can certify her and she'll be the youngest teacher. But I really want that to be a part of my family's life. My wife goes to it and, um, that laughter is like really important, but I would like to have, I don't know, we'll see how it goes with my wife, but I, I've always wanted 20 kids. And so <laughs> I want 20 books and 20 kids and I'll be happy. <laughs> and, and performing is done? Yeah. You know, it's really nice not having to perform anymore. I just show up and I can still get that, um, that camaraderie with people and that connection um, in laughter yoga, but I don't have to perform. I don't have to rehearse. I don't yeah. have to like tell any jokes. Still get some of that endorphin rush without the... <laughs> yeah spotlight on you yeah and so i don't know what it'll be like when i have to go on my next book tour you know what you know after that was my life and i loved it but yeah not so much anymore it just kind of left me okay yeah all right hey i really appreciate you uh coming by and telling your story i i i, I, I could talk to you for like two hours <laughs> just about your family history yeah 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 well i yeah. appreciate it man it, yeah, your family's all... still good everybody's good yeah still good and still wild and out still in chester still yeah yeah, a lot of us has spread out to like Portland and LA. And Is stuff your like father that, still uh, sculpting? No, he's he's you know he had a stroke um, for you right after my lung collapsed, um, and I oh. moved back from New York. He had a stroke, and so that was one of the main reasons why I just didn't get better and just take off back to New York. I wanted oh. to be closer to my family and kind of help help the family out. So, um, do you? But he's starting to paint his, a little bit. Oh, he is. Mm, yeah. Do, do you still have any of his pieces or anything that he's done? Well, most of his stuff was made, the roadkill sculpture, the to, yeah, it was made to disintegrate. <laughs> right, but he right. has it all over his house, like all a lot of the taxidermist stuff. Yeah. And um, there's a big drum that has like, I don't know, like turtle legs and like uh, the drum head is made from a deer skin and like it's a big rib bone that you beat on it. And so there's stuff like that. <laughs> it's really wild stuff. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot for coming by. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, there it is. That's my talk with Slash Coleman. My deepest appreciation to Slash for coming out to my humble abode for that little chat. He's just a nice, friendly guy. I'm grateful to him for sharing his story with me and with all of you. And if you're interested in learning more about laughter yoga, I suggest you do a little search on the internet, find something in your area. But I'm going to also throw the link to Laughter Yoga Richmond in the notes of this show so you can see exactly what he was talking about. And I'd be equally grateful for any of you to come on and share your story with me. You don't have to come to my house, although you are more than welcome. We can record remotely or, heck, I'll even come to you if you're local. So just email caughtbyhappy at gmail.com. Let me know what you've been working on and how it's making you happy because that's what it's all about, right? Doing what you love and having happiness find you in the pursuit of your passions. Okay, everybody, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Caught by Happy Podcast is powered by Ring Media. Join the Ring Media Network and let's make good stuff together.